Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, from where you are around the world, and welcome to the OECD Global Forum on Digital Security for Prosperity. Panel discussion titled Standardization and Certification. Are they fit for a globalized, interconnected world? It's a great pleasure and honor for me to, mod to moderate this session with such distinguished speakers and panelists. Allow me first to introduce our panelists for this session today. Lisa Carnahan, Associate Director for IT Standardization, US Department of Commerce, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NEST. Welcome on board, Lisa. Yuval Segev, Director of Advanced Technologies, Israel National Cyber Directorate, INCD. Welcome, Yuval. Vladimir, Radon Radonovic, Director, E-Diplomacy and Cybersecurity, Diplo Foundation. So there, Ithiraj, Global Head of Cybersecurity Office, Tov Sud. Welcome to there. So I don't think we could have a better qualified panelist to address the question that we have for this session today than the panelists we have today. Standardization and certification. Are they really fit for a globalized, interconnected world? Allow me first to start with our first distinguished speaker for today, Mr. Yuval. As a representative from INCD, Mr. Yuval, what do you think the current challenges that you are facing as a government entity and as a regulator in Israel with the standardization, conformity assessment, and certification that goes to different levels starting from devices, software, people, service providers. Mr. Yuval, we would like to hear from your side, your uh, insights and inputs in that. I think Mr. Yuval uh, is trying to pull out his presentation. So yeah. Go ahead, please. We can see your slides now. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Mrs. Bushra. Uh, it's a real great honor to be here. During the coming minutes, I will try to demonstrate and to share with you our perspective and our insights regarding the correlation between cybersecurity standards, cybersecurity certification, and the real uh, status of the the organization uh, cybersecurity maturity, if it's work or not, uh, actually. So I want to argue today that the current status is we have a problem. We have a problem with the correlation between certification and maturity uh, level. And the reason I argue that uh, that point is actually based on the, the fact that the three main pillars, the peoples, the processes, and the products involving in those um, processes, the certification uh, uh, process is actually not strong enough. For example, if we need to use a 20 years old guy with a two years of experience to audit a very big comp software company, and we uh, allocate uh, just a few days, and at the end of uh, this uh, process, he, supposed to come back and let us know if this software company is secure or not we have a problem and that's why i think that the current module the current mechanism actually the products which is actually the standards we are using the processes we are using and um, the the people that are already uh, using those standards we have a few challenges so the first pillar actually is the product. The product uh, in our world is the best practices or the standards we are using at the end of the day in order to uh, let the, the world, the economy know if the end user, the end entity is certified or not, if it's uh, secure or not secure. Here you can see a kind of form. It's an Israeli form, a kind of our local regulation. It's called the 161 uh, form. And I think, in my opinion, that this specific form is not a, not a, looks like a, a, you know the, the look and feel the, 
the, the GUI of this form is not up to date. And the reason actually is that this specific form looks like, like that is because, because of it's based on a, an internal standard that's first established before I was born, the year I was born. And uh, for example, you can see that uh, you need uh, to, uh, to allocate more space on the right hand uh, and not on the left side because uh, they thought that uh, you will probably want to, to put it in the binder and not to, to uh, save it in your folder on your computer. And this is just an example of how we think when we develop our standards and if it's already uh, up to date or if it's uh, just a, a link to the, to the, the last uh, decade or maybe sometimes uh, more than a few decades. So I don't want to argue that standard is not good. Standards are a great things. I'm working with, other, with standards all day, every day and all of us for sure using standards for security, for how we build the buildings and how we are uh, using uh, a lot of uh, things. It's a great things, but there are a few specifically issues we need to rethink about. And if we are combining the standards and the certification process together, and we try to look into the details and into the, the numbers, we can, uh, take a different point of view and to understand a few, uh, few things that, that looks different. For example, the ISO standards, here is the, the last uh, survey. Uh, and you can see that we have about 1 million uh, totally valid certificates for the ISO 909K uh, uh, and uh, less than half of that for the uh, 14K uh, standard, ISO standard. And specifically, if you are talking about the 2701 standards, we have less than 40K standards globally. And we need as a society and as NGOs and standardization bodies and regulators to think why we have only 40K certificate, certificate valid certificate. And you can see also that those, uh, those certificates uh, are related to the most uh, famous or most known uh, ISO uh, cybersecurity standards uh, that actually uh, published almost eight years ago. It's, it's firstly established on uh, two, 2005, eight, uh, eight years later, they uh, launched the second version. And uh, since then, we are uh, already with uh, this specific standard that uh, Eight years old, and uh, we're still working with these specific products. But we know for sure that things change. Things change, and we know that, for example, if nowadays SMS is a good practice, tomorrow SMS will not be a good practice. And if we think that, for example, a complexity password, complexity policy is something good, and maybe tomorrow morning we will recommend our uh, our. Uh, and user, our, the, the customer of those standards, that complexity is not uh, already needed because of the brute force, the bot, the way the attackers using the technology and our uh, last uh, uh, best practice, our last standard, not relevant for uh, the next uh, best practice. And if we will uh, suppose to uh, wait to the next version that will be in the next decade, it's too late. We can't uh, we can't uh, wait, uh, you know, like five years or eight years or 10 years uh, between uh, each iteration, between, between uh, standard uh, version one to version two and things like that. So this is, that was the first pillar, the, our products. Beside the first uh, pillar, we have the processes. And I think that our process have few specifically challenges, for example, uh, are we are using uh, just uh, questions or we are using technology to assess technologies? Uh, are we are using evidence and uh, things like that? Or we just came to a few hours talking with the, the audience and at the end of this process, let him know, okay, I think that you are already secure. The third pillar is a focus on the, the people, actually the certificate, the lead auditors, the guys that, take those specific standards 
and let us know that the entity is secure or not secure. And we have a few problems there because many of them have no, uh, not enough experience and the ability actually to let us know that the, this specific uh, end user or company is actually secure or not secure to understand those questions, to understand the, the way it's a work and how to, uh, to use those standards uh, in efficient manner. And I think if we try to, to stop, uh, to hold on, to rethink about why uh, why we did that why did we get to this uh, situation so it's because we made a kind of copy and paste we we take the the processes and the standards and the way we are using them and build them from other uh, issue uh, like uh, we are using them to certify the products or sometimes a uh, uh, management uh, systems and things like that and we just paste it into the technology world, to the cybersecurity world. And it's, it's world different when we are talking about technology. We can't use it as a copy and paste. And the, the, the main reason is because compliance, compliance is not a resilience. Compliance is not something that we want to use in order to understand, to get a, an answer to the question, is my organization secure, mature or not? So in order to change the current status, we have to take each of uh, those pillars, the people are using those standards, the standards by themselves, the process we manage in order to uh, let the company know that they are secure or not, or the customers, and to, to drill down into each of them and to use more evidence and technology and the um, different uh, prototype and uh, with more experience uh, guys and things like that. And we think that if we will try to shift from thinking of a standard as a product, as a product to standards as a service, something you can consume uh, on an on on online basis, you can just uh, pick your specific best practice and to use it and to check it and to, to use it uh, very uh, more uh, quick and fast, we will be in a very different uh, stage. And we here in Israel uh, developed a platform, actually kind of GRC tools, and we already tried to take all of those uh, insights and to implement it in a an holistic approach, holistic uh, mechanism. We have a, a GRC tool which is uh, for free to the market. They can uh, uh, sign sign uh, for free to our uh, national uh, platform to get all the best practices linkage between the, the controls and the risk and the, the compliance and the regulations and the, the and globally and, and global and local uh, different standards and to get all those uh, data and experience in a one uh, shot, one uh, dashboard. So I would love to promote and to encourage all the, the relevant uh, stakeholders to shifting from product to a, a service uh, approach of standards and certification and the uh, continuity control monitoring base and to to come to our uh, next version of standards and certification thank you so thank much you. yuval for sharing uh, those great uh, insights on the topic i like the idea of uh, standards as a service rather than standard as a product and I'm very excited with the model that INCD implemented for uh, standardization and certification of the different service providers. I personally looked into that platform and I think it's a very successful mechanism that uh, Israel uh, implemented so far. So Lisa, back to you. What do you think are the current do challenges with the, current with the standards with, development? With the standards are the elements that the should be fulfilled to meet the current demands and the connected world? Do you think the idea that you buy the idea that you buy uh, uh, standard as a service is a fee? Standard as a service is a fee. I I do. Um, I want to make sure you can hear me okay. Yeah. You can. Um, Yes, I do. I, I was taking notes. I'm 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 very interested in in uh, in in his approach. Um, I I think we all agree um, 
we started out, I started out in, in um, developing at NIST, at NIST, the cryptographic module validation program. That was one of my first projects. And we did follow um, a conformity assessment model after manufactured products, because that's all we had, right? And so I think in terms of um, standards and its development and the maturation of conformity assessment, I, I, I think Yuval is right, um, uh, spot on and in, in sort of a new way to look at this. Um, from a standards perspective, um, cybersecurity standards certainly has matured over, over many, many decades. Um, early years, it was very focused, very topical focused on functionality. Um, computer auditing was what, what things were called back then. Um, there were a few key players in the standard space. Um, there was some international participation, but the market wasn't as vast as it was today. Um, and I think we've we've matured to, to manage all that. I wanted to, to mention maybe three challenges. I view them as opportunities though. Challenges are always opportunities. Um, I think in the cybersecurity space specifically, there is a very strong desire to have one international standard that when implemented can meet many different organizations and nations, laws, regulations, policies. Um, globally. Um, and so I think there's opportunity to um, have that very rich discussion about technical cybersecurity standards, their ability to help meet those policies, laws and regulations, but not be the law policy or regulation. Um, so there's an opportunity there. I think there's a huge opportunity now for the vast participation we have in standardization. Companies showing up, we have users showing up, we have other sectors showing up to cybersecurity standards part, uh, standards meetings. I think that brings a richness um, that, that gives us opportunity to have um, very different perspectives and, and have better, richer standards coming out of those processes. And thirdly, and this is a challenge, it is an opportunity, but it is a big challenge that um, in, in recent years, a lot of standards efforts first focus on use cases. They want to develop use cases. Um, and that's fine, but um, products that implement the standards end up um, being used in very different ways. And when you talk about cybersecurity standards, now you're moving functionality into different types of environments, different risk levels, different uses. I think that's a, ch a challenge for, for SDOs to think about and how they develop their standards. On the conformity assessment side, um, I completely agree with the points that have been made. If this was easy to do, it would have been done a very long time ago, right? It's not easy to do. And, and part of it is because we have tended to focus on an individual product or service, and, and that is the focus of, of, of conformity. I'm saying conformity assessment broader than, than certification. Um, and there's a couple reasons. The changing threat environment, right? Um, if if you look at a product or a service in its state in a particular configuration, that configuration in that state gets changed when it gets updated. You have to you run that through your conformity assessment process. I think the first speaker talked about why that's a challenge to do that. Um, the other is with the changing threat environment, a product that has been approved in one way, either an attestation um, or an approval one day is suddenly vulnerable the next day because of the changing threat environment. That's really hard to manage in a conformity assessment um, system. The other that how an ongoing attestation, a certification or a self-declaration handles those changes in those products. We run a, a program for cryptographic modules and we continuously struggle with not the program itself not being the impediment for the product to be updated and, and pushed out into the field as a result of vulnerabilities. That's very difficult to do. Then that also gets to what the scope of the attestation means, right? What does the scope of the attestation mean if, um, if the, the product or service is continuously updated and further being used in environments that were not anticipated? Um, so I think there's some real challenges here. I think there's opportunities. I love the the first um, the first speaker's model. I think I think that's the direction sort of worth thinking as well. So I'll I'll end there. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lisa, for the great insights that are coming from, uh, let's say, standards development side and what are the challenges that we have with the standard development and then the conformity assessment. So those are like two different pillars. Each one of them has its own uh, challenges and uh, we need to address them separately. I agree with you. Um, so, um, Vladimir, uh, I know that uh, by end of May, uh, you led a very good session uh, through Geneva Dialogue with uh, many experts on, let's say, similar topic about uh, product standards and certification in the field. If you can shed a bit of light about the output of that session and what were the main, let's say, challenges that were highlighted by the attendees at that dialogue? Thank you, Dr. Busher, and, and thanks for the invitation. I think this topic is, is really important. And as we discussed previously, if, if uh, all of us here at the panel have some good exchange and, and, and fun, uh, it will be already useful. A bit of a background on, on Geneva Dialogue for the sake of uh, the argument, what I'm bringing into the discussion, because it's okay, I, I'm here on behalf of Diplo Foundation and, and uh, uh, leading cybersecurity uh, educational programs. But basically, I'm also uh, the lead of this Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior um initiative uh, led by Diplo foundation and the swiss uh, uh, federal department of foreign affairs where in the last year and a half we gathered some of the major global companies not only it companies um, to discuss the security of digital products and particularly what are the good industry practices in this regards in security by design and all that and what came out of some of the discussions is exactly what you've all started with uh which is the challenges with implementation and the whole environment of the standards uh not necessarily as, as also you've all mentioned and, and i think lisa standards are definitely good and useful and they are there but th there is something which doesn't work so what we uh what we went further on was organizing an event sort of a closed discussion which brought together these companies and many others together with lead uh, standardization organizations that means ISO, ITU, um, IC, IEEE, IETF, and, and some others, uh, along with a number of regulators uh, and uh, governments, uh, to discuss basically the same same outline of the challenges and ways ahead when it comes to um, security of digital products. So I do have a sort of a table of uh, mapped challenges and uh, responses out of that discussion and the previous ones. But I'll start with, with some of the challenges, and you'll see that some of them overlap with what we've heard. The first one is the pace of technological development compared with the pace of development and implementation of standards where you have you know for the standards all agree that we need consensus uh, and it, it's going to become more hard with uh, new players at the around the table but we need a consensus and it takes time and at the same time we have all the new technologies um, as, as Lisa also mentioned, the uh, changing environment in which these products are being used, uh, changing products itself, uh, updates, versions, and so on. Then the second challenge is the increasing importance of cybersecurity for the governments, for in the political realm, in a way. And we see more and more governments realizing cybersecurity is of national um, interest. And they're, they're making their steps towards some sort of regulating the national environment, whether through regulations, which is better probably because it's more of the incentives and policies but also maybe through the standards right through the sorry through the legislative process which might be tougher and that's where we can see the uh, fragmentation of the markets and what we see is that even those that are more advanced like singapore finland european commission are not necessarily following the same standards and that's where where the, where the problem starts the next challenge is uh, and we've touched upon and it's really important is the new the, is the changing environment of the standardization that means we have new actors so it's we used to be thinking about big industries which are important when it comes to compliance and all of that you know you have to have manufacturers the big guys but now we have so many um uh, startups uh, open source communities uh, uh smes which are producing tiny little bits of components whether it's a code or a device but mostly code which then penetrates through the supply chain and suddenly becomes critical and no one was thinking about these guys or girls actually being critical and those people usually don't have any understanding awareness of the necessity of security they don't have resources they don't have knowledge they don't have you know they're not in the process they don't see why they should be secure they need to think about you know existence and then we also have new um standardization organizations if you wish or environments such as open standards uh, so it goes beyond the i star environment then the next challenge is the corporate budgets which are 
shrinking in a way when it comes to standards that was realized by many and it's not going to be bigger unless we change the mindset and incentivize the corporations and the companies generally to understand standards and invest in them then we have the effectiveness and that's what basically you've all mentioned an implementation of standards which is which is dragging again the small actors uh, particularly have challenges with taking up the standards and understanding that but also the big ones and we've seen a number of cases where starting from from solo wins and others where i mean all the boxes were ticked but it didn't help so there is a problem with that then uh, an important aspect is a frontier between the information technology and operation technology which is blurring we have sets of standards dealing with internet with uh, information technology and that's mainly been, been done in uh, retails in financial sector there was a lot of discussions in this oecd meeting uh, about the it and, and security also insurance and others but there is the ot or operational technology which has another set of standards particularly iec and others and we see more and more the in industrial iot um, the use of products in different environments that lisa mentioned these these areas are blurring and now we have an issue how to cope with that and finally the supply chain complexity which we are all aware but that 90 percent of breaches basically come from the supplier side and there is a lot of uh, aspects there you mentioned some of them technologies processes people but i'll probably reflect on that more once we come to solutions in a way and back to you dr Bush. Thank you so much, Vladimir. I'm really glad to hear different, let's say, opinions from uh, uh, from uh, from your side as panelists. So I was expecting that most of the challenges will be repetitive, but it's, I'm really glad to hear different points of view. So, so, so there, I think you will give us, let's say, your point of view as um, as a representative coming from a well-known certification body and accredited accredited testing laboratory. What are the challenges from an implementation perspective of the standards? So let's say the conformity assessment or from the certification side or from the testing side, what are the main challenges that we are facing over there? Thank you, Dr. Busha. So I'm, I'm very glad to be a part of this panel and honored to be because the points uh, that were set by the other panelists, I think they've set a mark in terms of the challenges from a global perspective, but also from a cross-industry cross perspective. And I think I would like to begin with uh, the challenge of uh, the different regulations and standards that we have across the globe and new ones coming up. And uh, this is becoming a challenge for companies that operate in more than one country. And I think uh, we can all see the products and services that we use every day. And these are not, co these are not uh, constrained to just one country uh, doing that uh, service or product. So it's, it's more than one country a product. So I think we need to start to rethink in terms of regulations and standards. And there we need, uh, a, the key here is to think of harmonization. So I think the different regulators and standards need to be taking a look at the different perspectives and each of the perspective has its own right, right? So I think the way um, Vladimir just mentioned right now in Singapore and, and in the US, there are different views on, on the topics and also the, the attack vectors and also the threats that uh, that are existing in the different geographies could be different. And the way uh, that that the products are developed and the products are used in different geographies are different. So, however, we, when it comes to implementation, harmonization needs to be thought of, and this will make it easier to actually implement it. And, and the other topic that we need to think about is this age of checklist methodology. So we've been doing that at to suit with this functional safety in terms of checking for fire hazards, checking for life risks and so on. And in cybersecurity, I think the risks are evolving by the second. As we speak, the risks are changing. And I think having a checklist and having a cross uh, checkbox against this checklist, uh, this is already obsolete. However, the standards need to be constantly updated. And this update should come from a cross industry perspective. So not just from one industry, but from across industries, but also from across the uh, different countries, bringing in the different perspectives on the table, and that needs to be constantly updated. And these standards ensure that you have a minimum level of security. I think that needs to be clear. So what we're trying to achieve with standardization and certification is to achieve baseline cybersecurity status. And that's missing when we look at the smallest uh, companies that we have, and also the society at large. I'm going beyond companies right now to healthcare institutions, 
to public institutions like uh, schools, universities, these are being constantly attacked right now. And I think we need to take this whole ecosystem into account. And for that, I think if we throw a, a standard like a 27,001, which is large enough dinosaur, I think we might even scare them to not even start. So I think we need to start thinking of at baby steps, like baseline requirements. And I would like to quote um, here the uh, cross industry initiative chart of trust, where topics like supply chain security, security by default, certification of critical infrastructures, there are baseline requirements being put together across industries, and this will be the starting step. And these requirements are coming from these large standards. And at some point when people start to implement the baseline requirements, the next step would be to get into the certification. And, and I think I would uh, say one more thing. So certification and, and these requirements are just a starting point. You can definitely do more. Um, however, we would like to get all the companies, all the institutions that we have and the society to a minimum level of security and to be able to defend themselves against cyber attacks and also be cyber resilient uh, as, as we evolve with the cyber attacks and they're getting also sophisticated. So uh, with that, I would like to pass it on to you, Dr. Bushra again. Thank you. Thank you, so there for uh, the great inputs. Uh, I think when you mentioned about harmonization and we need to unify the efforts of the certification, it doesn't make sense that a single product is being certified in different countries, uh, different ways. This is actually one of the main topics that we are uh, discussing in uh, World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Cybersecurity. I'm leading that work group and uh, we are working on analyzing the current, let's say, issues and how we can harmonize that process of certification across uh, different countries. And we are uh, tackling three main areas, IoT devices, uh, people and service providers within uh, cybersecurity. And I agree with, with you, we need to start with baby steps before we come out with, let's say, a certification scheme that can match the requirements of different countries globally. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would like just to remind the audience, if you have any questions uh, at this stage, you can push them through uh, the chat channel and we can uh, give it to our uh, panelists. So let's now move to the, let's say, the bright side of the issue. How should we resolve that? Those are the challenges. And this is what we are facing right now. What are the best solutions or the best ways that we can resolve that? I know some of you, you already highlighted few, let's say, solutions or high level solutions on how we can do that. For example, so there you said we need to take um, small steps first and then go to a harmonization. But I would like to hear from Lisa, from standardization and conformity assessment point, point of view. How can we improve the issues and the challenges issues that, you the just challenges that you just mentioned about the conformity? About the conformity sure, can you hear me? Okay, I changed microphones. Maybe it'll be a little a little better. Um, so in terms of, of uh, so I have a little bit about standards development and a little bit about conformity assessment. And I do want to say I am very much enjoying this. We don't we don't all get too many panels with so many uh, conformity assessment aware people. So this is this is uh, this is very very enjoyable for me. Um, in terms of standards development, again, uh, standards you know standards development organizations by their nature must evolve um, and improve, or they're or they're not they're not relevant and they're not producing relevant standards. Um, when uh, you know, decades ago, a lot of IT standards, including cybersecurity standards, were developed primarily in the U.S. because that was primarily where the participants resided. Now um, it's it's international meetings, right? In, back in the day, you know, we had an international meeting every now and then. Now, you know, to, to fully participate, there's international meetings. Um, that has changed, obviously, with COVID. Um, and we've gone to virtual meetings. And I am hopeful that um, when, when COVID is managed and we're able to move around globally, that we don't abandon virtual meetings. I, I hope we go to a hybrid model. There's benefits to in-person meetings, but I, but I think the, the benefits of having um, folks being able to participate who normally would not be able to because they can't travel internationally to all those meetings. I think that benefit is there. Um, so I'm hoping we we stick in, we have a hybrid approach, hopefully. Um, 
in terms of um, standards, um, getting so so we want products and services that we can have confidence in from a cybersecurity perspective. That is ultimately the goal. And I think we've all we've all talked about how um, in the early models of looking at the conformity assessment processes of of, of manufactured products and services, that's not, not getting us where we need to be. Um, we're starting to think um, a little more about um, the software development processes and looking at ways to have confidence in those processes and the organizations that are developing the products and services. So we're, we're not abandoning looking at products and services, but we're shifting and looking at the software development practices used and the organizations and the management and governance, um, how they're developing them. So we have confidence in those organizations' ability to develop secure products and maintain and update them, which I think is, is key in all of this, that, that maintain and update them. Um, on the In the US government, we just issued an executive order 14028. Um, it's primarily, it has many components. One of them is for, for um, purchasing in the US government, so federal agencies purchasing products, um, where the software manufacturer can show that they've used a secure development process um, and that they're managing that process appropriately. Um, we're looking at ways to, um, what those requirements should look like and ways to determine those requirements have been met. Um, the past speakers, I think we've all realized we need to shift away from uh, paper documents and labels. Um, we're looking at other mechanisms to, to allow that attestation to happen on an ongoing basis that the manufacturer can make that information public and update it as need be. We're, we're exploring those avenues. One of, the, one of the benefits we hope to have besides having, having products or services um, that that um, are using secure software practices and, and good organizational um, or good organizational practices is that more organizations start to look at actually using software so secure software development practices in all kinds of software. We're hoping that it becomes a little bit more of the norm rather than the exception to sell to the US government or any other government. So we're hoping we're hoping we can get that. The other aspect we're looking at, and you talked about um, the previous speaker talked about looking, or no, actually you talked about looking at um, what are the minimal requirements. Let's start small. One of the things we're looking at is making sure we can include requirements that are easily determined to be conformant or to be met in the marketplace itself. Right. So, and some products, the ability to change a password. You don't necessarily need to have that tested in a laboratory because the market, the consumers, the purchasers can tell whether they can change a password or not. Right. So we're looking at that as well is how how much how many of these requirements can we push that can be determined by consumers and users in the marketplace. Um, I think that that will um, be very incentivizing for software developers to meet those requirements when it's when that cap when that ability is there. Um, in the same manner as standards, um, we're looking at the conformity assessment side of how we can look at products and services, their, their software development practices, and then their organizational practices. Um, I think we've, we've already heard the challenge will be finding that right level where we have confidence in those, those software practices, confidence in the products, confidence in the organization. Um, and no more, right? If you have too many requirements, it's 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 just added cost, and and that's what we're trying to manage here. It's a risk management process in and of itself, right? We want confidence at the at the least amount of cost we need to spend to get that confidence. I think that's going to be the challenge going forward there. Um, and then the um, and then in all of this understanding um, the challenges we've all talked about, which is the changing threat environment. The fact that these products and services are used in, um, at a point in time, unanticipated environments and uses. Um, who knew we would all be teleworking, right, vastly, and, and we all had our, our networks and our enterprises um, and our applications and everything set up to work per, in person, in our offices, on our own networks, and now we're all teleworking. So um, as these products are used very differently, we have to think about conformity assessment and that ongoing attestation, how that looks and what that looks like.
Um, and then I think one of the interesting ones that I've always, I've always been interested in pushing is exploring the relationship between standards development and conformity assessment. And not that, I'm not saying standards development organizations should start doing conformity assessment, but there is a, there is a vast knowledge from those who do conformity assessment using these standards. They're not implementing them, but they're seeing them in all types of products. And I've always, um, I've always thought it was a lost opportunity that we don't um, bring those two, um, those, those two groups of people together, those who are developing the standards and the conformity assessment side. I think in a lot of sectors, they're just very separate. Conformity assessment folks consume the standards, they understand them, and they understand them very, very well because they're looking at them from a uh, from a conformity a, a conformity perspective. So I think that um, I think there's a missing opportunity there as well that we should start bringing bringing those um, those those groups together. And maybe maybe your global council is doing that. Um, I wrote that down. I'm very interested in that. But but maybe that's an opportunity to sort of have those kinds of discussions as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. I think you shed the light towards lots of uh, solutions that can bridge those gaps. In the council specifically, we are um, started talking to each others on how we can harmonize or how we can reach to, let's say, bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements that can support the whole uh, process and can, let's say, reduce the certification efforts that different providers are doing in different countries. With that, I think we have a question that is very relevant to that uh, point. So uh, we have a question from Jaws Carlos. Would you consider mutual recognition arrangement as a solution on testing and certification, even if the standards are not harmonized? And I will say this question is to you, Yuval. You're the best one to answer that. And maybe if you can shed about other solutions that you have in mind, which will bridge the gap in, in, in that domain. Great, thank, thank you. I think that we have a different products, for example, in our case, different standards and one try to harmonize them and it's simple to do that if you will start on the goals because we are sharing the same goals all of us want the entity to be secure and the question is just about the way you can uh, build a, a long or short uh, standards a technical or non-technical standards and things like that but if we will try to focus on the outcomes and not instead of focusing on the controls by themselves to, to think about a risk based risk based standards or threat based here we can uh, share and agree about the the scope of the standards the scope of the outcomes and if we will uh, succeed uh, success to, to do that we can use any standards you want you can develop your own standards in order to uh, to achieve the the end goals to, to be certified and then you can uh, be aligned with globally uh, standards that you, you are not uh, the owner of them. Yeah, thank you so much, Yuval. But I think maybe in cybersecurity specifically, how one country, let's say, can uh, approve other countries, let's say, assessment, testing, and and others, maybe it's it's much complicated uh, than than other areas. So you you can see that there are harmonized certification other fields like engineering, for example. But it's it's much maybe difficult in cybersecurity domain. If you agree I, with I, me, I agree. I think we have uh, when we ask this specific question, our market, all the stakeholders, the vendors, the suppliers, the the customers, the regulators, they told us two main things. First of all. Please verify that the, the assessors, the people that are, uh, tell us that uh, the end user is certified uh, have uh, enough experience mm -hmm. because without uh, these specific issues, and I know that uh, there are a few uh, challenges regarding the business model and the, the, the salary and things that are the, the reality. The, at the end of the day, if you are uh, using a, a senior uh, guy or a junior, it it's makes a difference. And so, so first of all, we have to agree about the, the minimum level of experience and knowledge that we uh, expect uh, for the 
the accepted uh, auditors, okay? This is one thing, so without that, we can't uh, trust each other and to use the standards because maybe it's real great standards, but if you are using uh, your son or your friends or something that uh, is not a security guy, it's not work, it will not work. This is one issue and we, we need globally to think about the, the minimum level of the, those guys, the auditors. And beside that, they told us that they expect the standards to be in a minimum level, uh, for example, to, to verify that it's a uh, built uh, granularity and uh, with the uh, evidence, specifically evidence, and not uh, just uh, generally, but uh, more specifically, and uh, to let them know that uh, this, the relevant questions cover the relevant risks. This is the second thing they, they uh, told us. Yeah, I totally agree. Those are two important uh, key elements for bilateral or multilateral agreements in order to, uh, let's say, develop it between uh, different nations and different countries having different threats uh, attacking or targeting them. So uh, with that, I would like also to move to so there. So there, I think you have a question also for you over the chat here. So the guy is asking, it's somehow relevant to the part that uh, we, we hope you to contribute to, which is the solution. So um, uh, we have a question from uh, Jonas uh, regarding the bypass that Soder mentioned. How do we get SMEs and other organizations to implement them? Does it need government regulation or a voluntary approach? Is it enough if God develops these approaches or do we need different approach by standardization organizations to make this a more global effort? So you mentioned the solution while you talked about the challenges. Now, how we can make this happen, especially at the SMEs level? Thanks, Dr. Bursha. I think this is a very valid and a very real question. So this is a this is something that we are facing every day almost, and we've been asking ourselves as well. And I would start with a very high level view on how we see things. So we, um, we in the end effect, we would like to build, I think uh, Lisa mentioned that as confidence, and we would say trust in the whole ecosystem in the whole digital ecosystem in using our services, in using our products. So as a consumer, as a user, I know that my information stays, uh, that it, it needs to stay. And I know that, uh, who's having access to those uh, to the information that I have and uh, who shouldn't have access. And with that, uh, the high level view is to bring three dimensions together. So one is the business aspect of things. The other is the political aspect. And the third one is the technology aspect of things. And these three need to come together into play. And I will start with the business ecosystem. So if the question starts by saying, how do I start um, start to implement this at an SME level. And I think we should stop uh, looking at them as companies that, that uh, need to be certified, but rather that need a helping hand. And I think if we start looking at all the large corporations and the supply chain of the large corporations, they're mostly SME companies. And if we start looking at these companies and say that we give them the baby steps or these baseline requirements and start implementing them, we also need to think, okay, these requirements need to be also implemented by the large organizations. So how do we, and we see ourselves as users of these requirements or beneficiaries of the cybersecurity requirements that we put together. And then we can already see the challenges that these small companies would face. And it needs to be, it needs to start from top of each of the organizations, be it large or small organizations. The other thing with regards to the COT question, with regards to regulation, I think it's a mix. So it's a mix of voluntary, but also with a mix of regulations. And we have constant exchange with the regulators um, like the BSI in Germany, but also the other regulations at the European level and, and at the global level. And mandatory requirements from the regulators are one thing, but if the users and the manufacturers don't see a need for that, I think we will, we will never implement that. So the awareness needs to exist, but at the same time, we need to have mandatory requirements at areas where we need them. And at the same time, we don't need to overburden the SME companies with requirements. So that would be too much of a cost and they would rather say, I won't do anything at all. So I think we need to be very careful when we start talking about mandatory requirements, but we are all supportive of it and at the, at the sectors and at areas that are required. And the last topic that I would say in technology, but also in terms of general implementation 
is this risk-based approach. And uh, why do I take this risk-based approach? I think uh, we've all come in the last months and, and years as developed nations, we've seen the definition of critical infrastructure has evolved. And we've put down really uh, well-defined requirements for critical infrastructure, including our energy sector, including the financial sector. Of course, we can do more, but I think we've done that. And I think we need to look at this risk-based approach in terms of implementation. And the more, the higher the risk in terms of a service or product uh, or, or a supplier, I think more needs to be done in terms of showing compliance and lower the risk. I think uh, they could think of ways like self-declaration or self-assessment, but higher the risk, they need to comply with more requirements and also show more evidence in terms of, uh, in terms of compliance. So I think uh, with that, we could achieve a balance uh, level and not just overburden the SMEs, but also pick them up and, and bring them to a good standard in terms of cybersecurity. Thanks, Dr. Bushra. Thanks for there. Indeed, I think uh, all what you mentioned about incentivizing uh, SMEs and awareness and regulator support, I think it's a full, let's say, ecosystem that we need to uh, develop and we need to encourage in order to achieve uh, what we want to achieve at the end of the day. We cannot have regulators working alone, standardization bodies working alone, and then, as Lisa said, the conformity assessment groups working alone, plus uh, at the end of the day, SMEs and uh, service providers need to comply with different requirements in different, uh, in different countries. Uh, with that, I also would like to um, listen from Vladimir. Uh, so from the Geneva Dialogue, uh, what do you think, let's say, the main takeaways or the main solutions that the experts shared over there and how easy to implement them at the end of the day? I think that the second question is a million dollar question, how easy it is. But uh, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, build on, on what we've heard uh, and try to maybe structure also from the takeaways from our discussion in Geneva. That, uh, so one set of um, ways ahead is related to the change in the approach uh, to developing and implementing standards. And uh, standardization organizations themselves were quite aware that they need sort of a more agile process towards standards development. And uh, when we asked what does that mean, there were a lot of, lot of ideas, but some of them uh, mentioned, and I think you all mentioned that before, is actually embracing uh, new technologies, new approaches uh, to uh, develop and share standards. That means basically walking the talk, using the IT and, and away from the form that you all mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the other one was uh, related to the new formats of uh, standards and that builds to some extent to what Sudhir mentioned which is um, either developing some sort of a light standards or and uh, baseline requirements and baseline recommendation that Sudhir mentioned there was a, there was a lot of discussion exactly in that direction to what extent the newcomers in the field the smaller companies and even the big ones but let's focus on the smaller ones uh, need to embrace something much more basic and how do we come up to a basic requirements and some experiences from the Charter of Trust is, Siemens is also part of the Geneva Dialogue says that the companies take equally a long amount of time to come up to something like what the Charter of Trust, Trust came to. But those are very good examples of, of baseline requirements. Now, one of the questions, and maybe back to Sudhir afterwards, is if we look at the risk-based approach and uh, what sort of a, a risk might come up of, of the certain product, it's not that easy even, because for some of the products, you don't know where they will end up. And you might think it's, you know, a library, ah, who cares about a library, but it might end up in a very important um, software and critical infrastructure. So there are a lot of complexities there, but let's say the new forms of standards that might be considered, I can, I can tell you that many of the uh, standardization organizations that were with us uh, shared that, that uh, agreement of new approaches and also conformity assessment and the need to co connect the two. The second uh, big big block was about the cooperation. And there were a lot of suggestions that, for instance, while the uh, ITU, IC, and ISO work together, and there are certain good examples of how they work together, uh, there is a gap between them and IEEE, IETF, and maybe other open, open standards organizations and, and processes, where both of them agreed they should come together. There was even a sort of a suggestion of the informal uh, standard standardization development organization summit uh, and also uh, and that's the third pillar which is the role of the regulators which 
according to all of them, um, play a very important role in terms of aligning the certification schemes and their, their mechanisms to the standards and encouraging the uptake of the standards, including through, as, we, as we've heard, changing the demand side. Uh, so there was even a proposal for a sort of a new Bretton Woods summit, uh, which was back on the rules of commercial and financial relations, but something related to security and standards where we would have, and that's back to the basics, um, involved the businesses, standardization of organizations and, and uh, conformity assessment um, mechanisms and, and organizations, the regulators, the governments. And what should be maybe the components of that would be uh, building up on business practices, which are probably the faster ones, standards, regulate, regulations, but also norms and principles. And that's something which is very dear to us in, in Geneva Data, because if you look at the just recently adopted um, uh, uh, report of the UN group of governmental experts, which is a political mechanism on the highest level, it actually puts a lot of emphasis on supply chain, on misusing of vulnerabilities, security of digital products, that's how they call it. So we need to collect connect all of those. Geneva Dialogue does it on our end to some extent. The OECD has a mechanism or capacity for that. The World Economic Forum does a little bit of that. There are bits and pieces of supply chain in Paris call in, within the uh, organization, standardization organizations. So where would we take it next? I think is, is the, the critical question we should, we should maybe focus, focus in the next steps. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, yeah, indeed, I, I cannot agree anymore with, with, with the inputs that you just uh, highlighted. Uh, I have a question over the chat here. Uh, it's from uh, Jackie's. Uh, what is your view on composite certification? Would uh, such legislative approach speed up the adoption and implementation of cybersecurity features and products and services? I will leave it to you. Um, who would like to answer that question? Maybe you, while from a legislative approach, uh, do you think from a legislative approach, will, will that speed up the process? What is your view of having, let's say, you have a certification for the service providers and the services and cybersecurity. Uh, can you think of a composite certification um, uh, that can, let's say, uh, push that I, I think that if we will bring to the table all the stakeholders, let's just remember that uh, Wikipedia established uh, after 2000. And instead of uh, each uh, company will develop by themselves their own uh, knowledge, the, the community actually develop uh, the knowledge. And we all know now, now uh, Wikipedia. And we can build together as a community standard detection bodies, beside regulators and country, beside the market, a, a kind of cyberpedia, which means it's a globally standards that each uh, entity can promote and, uh, and share his experience. And if we will really think about that as a service, it's something that we can achieve together to, to develop the, the correct best practice, the globally best practice that we all agree about with a uh, globally uh, efforts and working groups that develop together the market, the SMEs, the regulators, all of us together to, to develop the, 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 the wanted, the desired, the best practice. Yeah, indeed. I think it's, it's a harmonized, it's a complete uh, ecosystem, as I said, that we need to develop. So I would, uh, I would like to ask the audience, if you have any questions, please, it's your time now. If you have any questions, please, please post them over the chat box that you have. Lisa or Vladimir, uh, so there, would you like to shed any inputs to the question that was just raised about composite? Yeah, about I'd composite, like to tell by the composite Sure. Um, so I'm not, you know, we may all have different um, definitions of composite certifications. Um, I think there are there are cases where um, there are approvals issued that require um, a certification of of something else, right? That there are um, 
there are programs that um, cybersecurity approval programs that require, for example, a CMVP validated product, right? I think for um, com composite certifications, um, we almost need clarity of, of that set of requirements and why that certification would exist. Um, I'm, I'm more intrigued with Yuval's approach of um, providing, providing the evidence that specific requirements are met and those get pulled together. And different folks may pull them together differently depending on the functionality and the use and then the risk level as well. I, I, I'd like him to sort of, at some point, I wanna learn how the risk level factors into, into the approach he's giving. Um, so I don't know that there needs to be a regulation that specifies that set of requirements and what that certification looks like. But I think where we have programs that can be drawn in and built upon, we can leverage um, the different um, certifications or conformity assessment, pull them together to build um, a package that, that where we have the evidence that we have confidence in, in, in trust, I think was the other word used, right? In, in the product or service we're trying to, we're trying to purchase. Yeah, indeed. It's it's again about the trust. It's again about how we can trust each others and how we can trust the certifications done uh, by, let's say, one nation and uh, being approved by others. Uh, so I think so. There, you want to add also to that point? Please go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Bushra. So I just uh, I was just also trying to understand what was meant by this uh, composite certification. Yeah. So I think it means to bring from different domains, and I think it touches the point that uh, that the previous speakers and also Vladimir mentioned before. Uh, cross-industry perspective, as mentioned before, and, and the certification on the cross-industry, cross-domain perspective is quite challenging in itself because the definition of a product, if I take an example uh, from a semiconductor industry and, and a cloud service provider, and the chip is the product for the uh, for the semiconductor industry, but for a cloud service provider, the chip would be just a part of that product or even a smallest component, right? And I think the definitions when we try to certify and when we try to standardize across industries, that's the first challenge. And 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 the, the second one is when we come up with requirements, we could say, hey, we don't need or you need to reset default passwords, or we we need to reset default passwords by default. And this could work in an IoT environment. But if you look at the OT environment, and sometimes uh, sometimes this can get really challenging because the users of that device or even the machine, um, I think once or once they 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 there's some reason, there's a risk that the that the user of that device or that machine is not available anymore. And if you say, hey, everybody needs to reset that password. And I think uh, the, uh, the the difficulty comes there because in an IoT device, you want to reset the standard default password. You don't want to have that. And you always want to keep changing it based on the user. But in an OT environment, this could, this could be a risk because once that's forgotten and you would have a risk of losing that tons of uh, machines that cost a lot of money as well. So there, there's, there's this challenge when we try to implement across industries and also certify across industries that we need to take the different applications into, into, into understanding and also the challenges of the different industry into understanding. But with that being said, when we try to increase or up the level of cyber resilience across industries, uh, we will also need to come up with standards that work across industries, but also up the level uh, uh, of the cyber cybersecurity. And uh, this, these are two aspects that need to be considered when we try to take a cross industry or a composite approach for certification. Yeah, indeed. I think you raised a very, uh, a very important point about the definition, how we define things. And it's, it's a bit interesting when we uh, started doing that study with World Economic Forum, when we were looking how people are defining uh, cybersecurity certification and how different international organizations are defining certification or conformity assessment from different point of views. And then it was uh, really difficult for us to, let's say, uh, look or to find uh, a unique definition for certification. We were always uh, we were always seeing that some part of that definition was missing. For example, we were lo looking holistically 
uh, for certification in, as I said, three areas, the devices, then the service providers, then the people. Usually when you find or the international standardization or the international bodies define certification only from the hardware or device point of view rather than from people or service providers. So the definition by itself was missing. Then the second, uh, the second point to what you were saying is, um, so how we define, for example, IoT, uh, what is the limit or what will it trigger that this device is an IoT device? So we started that process with one of our uh, uh, health regulators here in Dubai to look after biomedical devices that, so we have the IoT security standard that Dubai Electronic Security published for the city of Dubai and was implemented by uh, the stakeholders like four years back. Now we are looking into this certification, how we can certify and how we can do the proper attestation procedures that will tell us that this device is being certified. And this is where uh, we face lots of issues of the definition by itself. This device is an IoT, this device is OT, or this device is not in, in those two categories. So yes, indeed, I, I, I totally agree with that point. I'm not sure, but, uh, Vladimir, do you have any more input about that, about the definition itself? Because uh, I remember that in Geneva dialogue also that was raised. Yes, we, the, the, the definitions are definitely something uh, starting from the digital product itself, what the digital product and what the digital service is. And you'll find, uh, you know, even the OECD mentioning uh, and, and trying to, to define that. So there are a lot of open, open field uh, there. Uh, but I want to link this discussion to something that I think is critical in, in as, as maybe an underlying discussion in this changing the mindset of the approach towards standards. I think Sudir actually uh, placed it very well in the previous uh, contribution that the companies actually need a helping hand rather than to be certified. We need to start thinking how to incentivize and help the companies to get the grasp of all that. One of the suggestions during the dialogue we had, I think it was from, from IEEE, uh, was that that the security should be considered as an as an ethics even now uh, in building the product so sort of an ethical aspect it's it's more than than the tick the box it's more than the compliance and incentivizing the companies to actually um shift left to introduce security into into the whole uh development process life cycle and all of that is the key now how do we do that that's i think that's the, the critical thing helping them and i think you was comment on um helping them to understand what's out there and then coming down to these baselines and then from there moving those that can uh, into into real standards so to call them uh, is is the critical thing how to change that mindset and uh, bring aboard and I, I know because we have uh, um, among a number of big companies uh, the, the giants if you wish uh, of the IT on the board we also have the Papua New Guinea ICT cluster and you know how could possibly these folks uh, embrace anything that we're discussing if that's actually the startups which will end up somewhere in the supply chain. So I would I would sort of underline this importance of a mindset shift uh, that all together think about how to incentivize uh, the, the embracement of, of light standards and all that and then the big standards rather than comp only the compliance, right? It, it matters, but it's not the only, the only thing. Yes, indeed, Vladimir. So incentivizing um, uh, uh, different stakeholders is very important in order for the ecosystem to roll out. Uh, we have a question over the chat here from Neil, and he's asking or she's asking, what do you think about specific mandatory security requirements, for example, uh, like default passwords? Do such rules incentivize a compliance culture opposed to a security culture? I think, Lisa, you, you answered, let's say, portion of that previously. A portion you, of that previously. And, and you suggested that the uh, use of the to highlight what what needs to be compliant with. Uh, what needs to be compliant with. Sure. Oh, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes. OK. Um, so we're we're actually looking at this as part of um, a, a number of activities we we have at NIST, as you know, or many of you know, um, we publish a lot of guidance and requirements, and they're and they're based on risk, right? Um, but but we also recognize that that there should be minimum sort of minimum requirements for things. If if you 
Um, if you look, we recently published a document specifically for IoT devices that that was a minimum baseline, a minimum baseline set of requirements, and it was things like the ability to change passwords, the ability to change a default password, the ability to do up get updates. It recognizes that not all devices are in environments where that makes sense. And I think the OT environment we recognize is a little different, but I think, you know, there's probably some on the consumer, you know, non-OT, maybe the IT side where that doesn't make sense. But um, we have that guidance out. Um, currently, it is, um, it, is, it is voluntary. It is not mandatory guidance. Um, and so I think that, um, um, you know, we're using more the, the carrot approach than a stick approach, um, rather than making them mandatory, make them voluntary. We're hoping that um, using mechanisms that some of the other panelists talked about of raising awareness to try to create that demand for things like simple things like the ability to change passwords, the ability to get software updates um, to create that demand side um, is 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 much more attractive to us in terms of um, demand. Having a demand is always better than having mandatory right in, in in these cases and so um we're certainly hoping that um i think the um the executive order i talked about um looks to NIST to try to um um come up with a set of requirements for iot devices um that that conformity can be expressed for consumers so we're looking more at the consumer side and we're and we're looking at that we're looking at what are those mandatory what would be those requirements um, and then, and then, from a voluntary perspective, what would conformity, um, conformity evidence and attestation look like? Um, probably those requirements will be based in part on the baseline doc, the baseline requirements we've already published. So we're not we're putting together a program that will be voluntary. The re the requirements exist. Um, it'll be a voluntary. Um, uh, um, mechanisms to have evidence of conformity, attestations, things like that, um, but it's not going to be mandatory at this point. We're given we're given voluntary another go. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. I think we are um, uh, we are aligning in terms of the solution. So we are all saying we don't need mandatory. We don't need to enforce. We need to make it, uh, let's say, more flexible. Incentive mechanisms and other other mechanisms that can roll out all of that. Uh, I have another question that says, uh, for, it's actually from uh, Johan, and he's asking, or she's asking, do you have any input about cloud computing certification? Anyone from uh, the panelists would like to answer that? I, I will add a bit of inputs into that, but after you, you, uh, you share your input. Yeah, so there. So thanks, uh, Dr. Bushra. I think I'm curious about your inputs as well. <laughs> so I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to uh, uh, cover, that as well. to uh, cover that as well. So I think in terms of cloud, uh, we have seen uh, that you all mentioned before the ISO 27001. So the, the information security in cloud. So there are some basics that are already covered by the ISO 27000 standards. The ISO 27017, I think, that also talks about cloud uh, in terms of information security in the cloud. So that's an extension of the basic uh, information security standard. Uh, but the other things that are coming up at the European level is uh, there is there was a discussion a couple of weeks ago, ago with the European Cloud Code of Conduct. So that talks about some security requirements in the cloud. There is also from the ANISA discussions in terms of cloud certification and also from the German BSI that has a cloud uh, security controls catalog. I think it's called C5. And these are in, in overall what is expected to, to arrive or existing in terms of cloud. But we've also seen some cross industry topics in, in, in terms of the cloud security alliance. I think it's called, they have a cloud security controls catalog that also covers in terms of uh, security uh, controls in terms of cloud security. I think that's that's in a nutshell, uh, talking about cloud security. Maybe I've missed uh, certain things, certain aspects, but uh, I'm also curious about your inputs, Dr. Busha. Yes. We're here, so in Dubai and in Dubai Security Center, we actually developed a certification mechanism for cloud service providers. 
who would like, let's say, to offer services for the critical national infrastructure. So it's again not mandatory for everyone working in Dubai, but it's only for those who are, who would like to host, let's say, critical national infrastructure data. In. And we wouldn't like to reinvent the wheel. As you mentioned today, so there are many standards that goes towards cloud security requirements. So we requested them to consider few uh, certification against uh, standards like ISO 27001, ISO 27002, and ISO 2717, plus the CSA, as you mentioned, cloud controls matrix. We did the mapping across all of those standards, and then we came out, let's say, with controls that are coming from the national standards rather than reinventing the wheel and developing our own. Plus to all of that, we mentioned that they need to comply with certain controls from, um, uh, let's say, a national standard that we are developing and we are implementing or we are dealing with in Dubai called information security regulation. As long as they have certification against those standards and as long as they are adhering to the controls we have, which are, again, internationally recognized, they can get the certificate and they can work with the critical national infrastructure Besides to all of that, we followed the best practice where we, we developed or we recommended or we put, let's say, the framework for the certification, but we assigned a certification body to certify against that standard rather than us doing the certification, then we will have, let's say, a conflict of interest in that, in that case. And we put certain requirements for certification bodies who would like to implement our standard in Dubai. And those requirements are coming mostly from ISO and the other international uh, standardization bodies. So this is, this is in a nutshell what we did, uh, our example for, uh, in Dubai, how we implemented the cloud certification scheme in Dubai and how easy that was and how it facilitated our journey when it comes to the cloud. Um, so I think it's already uh, uh, 4.15 in my time. So with that, I would like to thank all the great panelists for your excellent insights into the questions that were raised. And I would like to thank the attendees who are attending this session virtually. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, take care, everyone.